Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, The Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And today's guest is a big deal. I have to put on my, my anchorman voice. <laughs> but, but before we talk to our guest, I'd be remiss if I didn't properly introduce my co-host. You know him. You love him. Scott Todd from scotttodd.net, landmodo.com. And most importantly, if not automating your Craigslist and your Facebook postings, postingdomination.com forward slash the land geek. And uh, today's guest is best selling author of one of our favorite books, Profit First. One of my favorite books, The Pumpkin Plan. Probably one of Mike McCallum's favorite books. His first one, The Toilet Paper Entrepreneur. You know, Mike, he was on our podcast um, a while ago as well. But we're going to talk about his new book, Clockwork. Mike Michalowicz, welcome back. How are you? It's a joy to be back. Mark, thank you. And Scott, it's good to meet you. Thanks for having me back. I really appreciate this. All right, Mike, let's just get into it. What the hell is clockwork? So uh, I'll start with the subtitle. It's Design Your Business to Run Itself. And what I think it addresses, Mark, is the most, I think, insidious form of poverty we have. I think when we look at entrepreneurs, business owners, we think of traditional you know, impoverishment, they're struggling, they're broke, they have no money, but I found, found there's this more insidious version, which is time poverty, where the business becomes all encompassing. We, we put our family last, we put our life last. And that, that's what I was doing. And, and by the way, proudly doing, because I was calling myself a workaholic and I had to do this for my family. And, you know, this is, this is what success is. And I discovered it's not. A, a business that is dependent on the hustle and grind of the owner is a business that has no independence a business that's truly successful is a business that can run itself, that the owner can leave and the business continues to scale. And so clockwork is about this process. It's, it's a simple process. It's not easy. It's a simple process of making the business run on automatic. I, I, I love it. I love it. Um, as, as I'm looking at the contents of, of the book, why your business is still stuck, analyze your company's time, uh, the queen bee role, serve yeah. the QBR. What is the queen bee role? That, great question. Cause that's the most common question I get. And, and it's the most important concept, I believe out of the entirety of the book. So the queen bee role, well, here's how it came about. And I'll tell you what it is. I was studying business efficiency. And so I had this hypothesis of how it worked, but then I started interviewing all these different companies to see how this played out. And I found I couldn't find a common thread. I, I went to Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. It was, it was one of the largest playset manufacturers in the world called Playworld Systems and found that they were extremely streamlined. It's like, okay, they got the solution. Let me see if this plays out at the next stop, which was a pizza shop that could bang out more pizza than you could ever imagine uh, with a small staff. And the processes were definitely, they were significantly different. They had their own recipes for efficiency. And what I found is when you can't find a solution you need, often we need to look at nature because nature holds the the ultimate truths, I think, to unlock the universe of business, at least. And um, I found that beehives, of all things, are extraordinarily efficient. Their use of energy is very low, yet they can scale a, a large colony very quickly. So I started studying bee colonies. And specifically, they follow a simple two-rule set that I believe now every business needs to follow, too. The first role in every colony is to protect the most important function that it hinges its survivability, its success on. What that is in the, queen, in the beehives is the production of eggs. Now, it happens that the queen bee is the one doing that. So that's why I call it the queen bee role. The queen bee in beehives lays eggs. And the reason laying eggs is so important is that bees die very quickly. And if there's not new eggs being produced, therefore new bees being spawned, the entire colony will be wiped out within a short period, usually weeks or, or a few months. So they have to be producing eggs. And every bee knows there is nothing more important than the production of eggs. The second rule they follow is once egg production is occurring and that's been satisfied, they can go and do whatever their primary job function is, collecting nectar, defending the hive, heating it or cooling it. Well, this runs parallel to business. And I'll, I'll tell you how to find it. And it's best shared an example. I like to use FedEx because FedEx is such a globally recognized brand. FedEx has something that they hinge their success on, and we all do. It's a singular thing. What we hinge our success on is the delivery of our promise. 
So the first question I ask every business is what is the big promise you make to your customer? And maybe we make multiple, but what is the biggest, the most important promise? And FedEx's most important promise is to deliver packages on time. They, they offer other things, good customer service. We have print shops and stuff like that. But the number one promise is delivering packages on time. Once we know the promise, we peel back the onion one layer and say, what activity, that's the QBR, what activity is making that promise a reality? Now, there's, again, there's multiple things we can be doing, but what's the most important activity making that promise a reality? And for FedEx, it's logistics. We promise to deliver packages on time. Therefore, the movement of packages is the most important thing we do. And my argument is FedEx can't say one week, you know what, let's skip out on package delivery. Let's not worry about the logistics. It would crush the brand. FedEx may go out of business that quickly if they ignore their core competency. The QBR for our business is the same, found the same way. We have to determine what's the biggest commitment promise we make to customers. I'm an author. My biggest promise is to make complex entrepreneurial topics simple. That's my promise. Then I say, what's the most important activity that delivers on that promise? Well, it could be speaking. It could be what we're doing in interviews. It could be something else. And I think it is. I think it's writing. And what I mean by this is once you know your QBR is, that's the one thing that can never go compromised. You must always be delivering on it. You always must be elevating the game for that one thing. And if you slip up in the other categories, it, it, it may hurt you a little bit, but it won't put you out of business. If I said, you know what, screw books, I'm never going to write a book again, I'm done. Or FedEx said, screw logistics, we're never going to do it again. FedEx and myself will both be out of business. If I say, you know what, I'm going to put off interviews for six months because I got to write books, it may hurt some of the exposure for me. Uh, it may compromise some relations like you and I have, Mark. But if I'm still producing great books, then I'm positioned to continue to uh, excel. And so that's why I challenge every business owner to do with clockwork is determine what your biggest promise is, rewind one step, say what's the activity that supports it. That's your queen bee role. Never let it go compromised. Scott Todd, what are your thoughts? No, I mean, it, it just makes sense, right? You know, because if, if, FedEx, if FedEx were to say, hey, you know what, we – we got to, we can't deliver packages today. There'll be no delivery today because right. we need everybody to work on our, uh, our, our mobile app. We're going to have everybody testing our mobile app and we can't deliver, you know, we can't deliver today because everybody, all of our employees are going to be doing this other activity. Everybody would, I, I mean, like everybody would be like, what, what the heck? The Fred Smith would be out of FedEx as CEO like that because, you know, he didn't, he didn't manage the priorities right. And I, I like the I like the example of the Queen Bee role, and I do agree with you, Mike, because everything everything in nature does relate back to business. Yeah. I mean, it's it, it, you know everything. If you can find it in nature, you can find it in business. So glad you brought I that up. Build on the thing you said about FedEx, Scott, because you're you're spot on in my opinion. In that, if FedEx diverted all their people toward the mobile app and, and and removed them from packages, they're done. The interesting thing is they actually do the reverse they will take people out of the app development and get them on trucks to deliver packages. Happens every holiday season. The winter holidays demand surges. I think it was like a two to 300% demand growth uh, in, in package shipments because of all the holidays in that time. What FedEx does is they say, okay, now we got to put two people on the truck. We need to recruit managers and get them in the distribution rooms and on the trucks. We need extra staff. So they will actually flow people over to make sure that core competency goes. They won't do the reverse. So I love how you said it. It's very eloquent and it's the point. You can never compromise that core competency. So, so Mike, okay, I get my queen bee rule, right? I'm super focused on my core competency, but I know, and I'm speaking from my own experience, it took me years to start to scale because I had this deep fear that if I wasn't doing the work, it wouldn't get done as well as what I could do and that everything would suffer. Yeah. And how, how do you get the entrepreneur to sort of switch it in their mind that, Hey, don't build yourself a job, build yourself an actual business that can run without you. So Mark, there's a label for what you did. Uh, it's called being a human being. So uh, congrats. That's totally normal. And that's the total typical response. Um, and I, I devoted a lot of the research for this book to, figuring out this phenomena, and I now call it the superhero syndrome. And what it is, is in the beginning of a business, particularly for a solopreneur, it is necessary that we do everything. Uh, and we start believing that we can do everything. What happens then is when we make those first few hires, it is actually more efficient for me just to give everyone the answers. 
uh, to swoop in and save the day. You know, that one customer that's bitching and moaning or whatever, I'll, I'll fix that. I'm the owner here. Uh, that one employee that's threatening to leave or, you know, needs some special negotiations for their circumstances. I'm a superhero. I'll swoop in and do it. And as I do more and more of that activity, these two phenomena happens. First of all, for myself, it actually satisfies my ego. Every time I save the day, there's a little uh, dopamine release. And I'm like, hey, look how great I am. Secondly, my colleagues um, are served by it because if they take my direction or let me save the day again, they can do no wrong. So why not have the superhero swoop in and fix it? But if we look at it from the other perspective, uh, a superhero is kind of a negative term, in my opinion. I mean, my favorite superhero growing up as a child was Superman. But when Superman comes in and fights Lex Luthor, he is disabling the military or the police force from actually doing it themselves. They become more dependent upon them. If you look at the, you know, the Batman flicks, the commissioner, the police commissioner has a bat phone. He's got a 911, not to the police, but to Batman. <clears throat> you know, we are disabling our community, in our case, our colleagues from playing up at a higher level. We're disarming them. The other thing is we also, also leave a wake of damage behind us because we're superheroes. We swoop in, we fix it. Superman comes in, defeats Lex Luthor, but he decimates New York City. There's no movie about the recovery from Superman's damage, like the next 50 years after he <laughs> effed up New York. And sadly, that's the experience of us entrepreneurs. And, and super sadly, I did it today. We had a little team meeting here and uh, one of my teammates said, uh, Mike, what's this new program called Author Up? It's something I conceived. And she had no clue what was going on. She was getting inbound phone calls about this thing that Mike's doing. And my own employee didn't know it because as a superhero, I had this great idea. I spent my five minutes doing it and the remaining 100 or 99% of stuff that needed to be done, I just ignored. And now my team is doing cleanup behind me and it distracts them from doing the work. They have no clue what they should be doing and brings about confusion. So what we need to do is change the label. I think this is the first significant step. No longer see yourself or call yourself a superhero. Instead, be a super visionary. And the distinction between these two is a superhero saves the day. We shouldn't do that. What a super visionary does is has a clarity around the outcome they want for the organization, for their colleagues, what the ultimate uh, f feel, touch, taste, look of the organization is going to be. And then choreographs our resources, our, our employees, even our clients, our technology, organizes it to get to that vision and then constantly corrects in, in the choreographing of those resources when there's problems. That's what we need to do. And I think it starts by changing the label. I love it. I love it. Scott Todd, what are your thoughts? The, the years of rebuilding after Superman swoops in. I love that. I think, I think um, you know, th that is, in fact, one of the things, too, is um, it, I think that, Mark, I think one of the hardest parts of being an entrepreneur is that one component that says, I'm not going to do the stuff that I'm not good at. You know, and, and like, I, I can mess around with, with uh, Photoshop. I can throw words on a picture, whatever. But it's not in my it's not in my wheelhouse. It's just, I'm not that good at it, right? Like I take longer to do it. I overthink it, and it's so e it would be so easy if I just gave it to somebody who that, that that they love Photoshop or whatever it is. Just give it to somebody. Let them do it. It's gonna it's gonna come back to me faster. It's gonna look better. But the reality is is I either don't want to pay for it because I'm I'm like oh my god I, I'm gonna have to pay somebody. Well, you can find people in today's environment, you can find people very, very cheap that like to do stuff like this, okay? Like th there's people, I kid you not, there's people on, on uh, Craigslist, they will like record, like video your entire uh, wedding or take pictures of your wedding, like for free, just because they're trying to get experience. Now, I wouldn't say hire them really for your wedding unless you wanted to. However, you can always find people that, that are better at things than you are leverage it and then get out of it. And, and to Mike's point, then you don't need to be the superhero because now you're do, like, you're good at doing what you do. Mike's great at, at, at writing books. Okay. Like, like he said, he's great at writing books, doing interviews, but it'd be terrible. I, I assume if he tried to make the book cover, he'd spend too much time right. on it right. and all these other components, leave it to the people who know what they're doing and get out of your own way. And I think your business will grow faster. You know, and it, it's got so funny. So yesterday I met with my publisher. It's, they're called Penguin Books. And uh, I was out at the offices 
and like, hey, we have some cover designs, we want to talk with you. And I believe as a visionary, I have to just make sure there's congruency between what I'm trying to communicate in all forms. So for me, it was very clear saying, oh, that book cover idea stinks, that one stinks, oh, that one's, now we're talking, let me tell you why. And I believe that's my role. I can interject for you know 60 seconds in where they're going and give them clarity on the path. They simply are just, without direction, kind of go down these aimless paths. And the, the response to the superheroes, you are idiots, you have no idea what you're doing, let me swoop in and do book cover design all by myself. The response of a supervisionary is, I haven't given you enough clarity, let's reorganize our, our, our team here to move toward this goal and constantly be the tweaker in how we're marching forward. Uh, and it becomes, you know, you get better output because they're far superior to the kind of work. They just need the understanding of the vision so there's this commonality or cohesiveness across all things that I'm doing. I mean, like, no. if you're answering a question, like, one time, especially to your team, like, to, in my opinion, if you're answering a question to your team, well, then take that, take that question or that answer that you just gave. It's not, it's not in a vacuum. You got to take that thing. You got to have some tool or mechanism, especially when you're dealing with your team, that you can put it in place so that they can, they, it's like the knowledge bank, right? Like, hey, mm-hmm. here it is. So before they go and they start to bug Mike on, hey, Mike, how do I do this? Oh, let me go check to see if this has already been answered. And then Mike can really just focus on the stuff that he's really, really good at, as opposed to being the superhero. Right. I love that. And, and it's true for every employee too, right? Let, move everyone toward their strengths. And uh, so in the book, I talk about this concept of capturing. Uh, it's exactly to your point, like a knowledge base. I believe a lot of it can be done through video, in fact. Oh, yeah. And, and transferring. And one little tip I've discovered here, Scott and Mark, is that when I give a responsibility, for example, I used to do invoicing when I started as, my, as a solopreneur even in my most current iteration, I made my first hire. Her name was Jackie. I said, Jackie, I need you to do invoicing. Well, what did I do is I recorded a video uh, showing all the steps. And a couple of things I did when, when she came back with questions, I said, well, I hired you for what's on your head of yours. So you got to make the decisions. And she did. Um, I had to be very disciplined and not just doing the quick solution of blurting out an answer. I had to force the answers back upon her for her to decide. But I think the most important thing I did was I said, once you've mastered this process over the next few weeks or maybe the month, I want you to record another video giving our new standard for how this procedure goes. Because ultimately the best student in any room is the teacher. And if Jackie could teach this process and train it, uh, I knew she had mastered it. And I also knew when, when and if she ever decided to leave that her knowledge wouldn't go with her, we've captured it. Yeah, no, I love it. I mean, Mike, do you ever get any type of entrepreneurial anxiety? Right. Let's Never. say you're, you're taking a <laughs> month been, off and things are, going. things are going really well. Yeah. And then do you ever think, okay, I've, is this delegation or is this abdication? Sure. So I, I get anxiety regularly. Um, and it's funny. So most entrepreneurs, I would say, are micromanagers. So they fail to delegate. Uh, very few, but some entrepreneurs are abdicators. And sadly, I shouldn't say that. That's just the challenge I face. I think it all gets resolved when we have the understanding of what delegation is. I believe many entrepreneurs, and I myself thought that delegation was the assignment of tasks, which is not delegation. That's more like task rabbiting. You know, go do invoicing, I would say to Jackie, or go do this. I thought I was delegating work to her. I was not. I was task rabbiting. Because then she'd have to come back with questions, and I'd have to answer them or so forth. Um, delegation is the assignment of outcomes. So where I said to Jackie, um, we need to bill our clients timely and accurately, We've established best practice to do this. It's our invoicing. So I want you to follow the guidelines of this. And as you go through this process, if you see opportunities for improvement or you have questions, it is your job to answer it. When she'd come back in, she would, uh, with questions, I'd say, well, it's back upon you. You have to make decisions and move us forward. So that's what true delegation is. And to prevent being, being an abdicator, I have to have some measurement of conclusion, meaning did she complete the task successfully as I deemed how we're going to quantify success? So those measurements become very important. How I do it, we, we have a daily huddle. We're small. We have 14 employees here. But when every morning, we had a meeting this morning, and we throw up the board, we, we go over numbers. And I can see now just by the, the flow of numbers uh, how the health of the business is. When it comes to invoicing, which is not really a major problem, I just see how many uh, – clients have renewed for the day and I just watch that process. And if a number is out of whack, 
it kind of causes a red flag or a green flag. Sometimes it goes way high. Sometimes it's way low. That means that it's a call to action. So I've avoided becoming an or defaulting to my abdication nature by being a true delegator and having measurements in place that act as a pulse monitor. I love it. I love it. How, how do you determine as the entrepreneur on a, a daily or weekly basis, what the most important goal that you want to accomplish is for that week? Do you, as the visionary come up with it yourself and then meet with the team? Is it a team idea? Is it, I mean, how do you go about that? And then how do you know, okay, we've executed on this. Yeah. So we don't measure in weekly. We, we actually measure in daily. We call it the big one and we measure in, in quarterly. So every 90 days. So I will, we do it through our huddles and quarterly meetings. That's how we do it. So we, as a group, we had a quarterly meeting yesterday, which was the end of Q1, even though I know we were uh, two weeks into Q1 is the only day we could get. Basically we do a conclusion of Q1 and then we say, what's our planning for Q2? Hopefully at the end of Q2, we'll be meeting a little bit earlier than, than having this two week lag. But we explain what, where the business stands and where we want to go. Then each person says, what's the biggest thing they can do to move us toward that common plan or intention we have and exploits their core competency. We've made the mistake and, and I continue, it's, you know, this is my business. I continue to lead us occasionally into mistakes of these ideas we have and then putting the wrong people on the wrong seats and then getting frustrated with them when quite frankly, I, I put the wrong person in the wrong spot to do something or maybe that thing wasn't even necessary. So we do have these quarterly goals and we do it collectively. On a daily basis in our huddles, every morning, we did it again this morning, everyone goes through and what's, say, what's the biggest one for today? So as an example today, um, I had a call with Gary Keller, the founder of Keller Williams, talking about some collaborative opportunities. And I explained to the team, that's the biggest thing I can do to move our business forward toward the vision we have in today, today's goal. Tomorrow morning, I have to report back to my team, how did that go? And what's my next plan for the next one? They have the liberty to say, Mike, who cares about whatever, that goal you set, let's, let's do a different goal. And we can do this for each other. So there's cross accountability. And on the board every day, we have 14 individual goals. And we always have this quarterly goal for the entire organization that we're moving toward. Wow, I love it. Scott Todd? I, man, yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's, I like that idea. My, I might need to grab some. Uh, oh, we were some... recording. We were recording actually of our huddle. I don't know if you can Google it. If you type profit, so the organization behind my books, or at least one of them, is called Profit First Professionals. So yeah. if you Google Profit First Professionals huddle, I think you'll actually see it. You can watch a taping of us do it. All right, we're going to do that. I'm going to do it when we get out this I think call. it's it. And if, I, if not, I can, send, I can have the link sent to you guys. Okay, cool. That's cool. All right. All right, Mike, I mean, we're short on time. So is there any question we should have asked you that we didn't ask you? Um, no, like, like, no, I mean, no, I don't, I don't think so. I, I, th I think the essence of clockwork is, um, is getting out of this mindset that hustle and grind is a good thing. I think I, I, I bought into that. And, and listen, I understand the sentiment behind that that's the popular nomenclature now is, is hustle grind. It used to be workaholism uh, 10 years ago, right? There's always a new term for it. And uh, I understand the sentiment behind it. And I think it has a value, but I believe entrepreneurs today are absorbing it as the standard operating procedure. That's how entrepreneurs need to behave. And I think that's the grand mistake. An entrepreneur is someone who choreographs resources, who organizes people and things and technology and are all the resources available to achieve a outcome. We are not the chess pieces. We're the chess player. Uh, and that's the important thing I want to communicate with everyone. I love it. That that's the tip of the week. We are not the chess pieces. We are the chess player. Uh, Scott Todd, what's your tip of the week? Listen, I do yourself a favor. If you haven't already done this, go and buy and read, listen to profit first. You got to do it. Like I'm a big fan of this. I teach it in flight school. I teach it in accounting for land investors. I live by this thing. Go read it and execute on it. Go I do love it. it. I love it. Yeah. I mean, in my tip of the week, again, I mean, I, I love all the books, but we are such, I mean, Scott, this is pretty much really what is the core of our business yeah. is, is right. creating a, a business and not a job for yourself. And so it would be really 
really sad if you don't pick up <laughs> clockwork and the way to get it is it's going to be on amazon and all the other places but um you want to sign up for it at mike mccallowitz.com forward slash books and we'll have a link to it because there's about three people in the world you can spell uh, it yeah Bell mccallowitz yeah. and yeah. that's not including mike's family <laughs> so yeah. Uh, go there and do that. I want to thank all the listeners. Um, please, the only way we're going to get the quality of guests like Mike McCallowitz is if you do us three favors. You got to subscribe. You got to rate. You got to review the podcast. Send us a screenshot of that review to support at thelandgeek.com. We're going to send you the $97 passive income launch kit for free. Mike, are we good? We are good. Gentlemen, thank you so much for having me. Thanks, thank Mike. So Scott, we're good? We're good, Mike. All right. Let freedom. Ring. Ring. Thanks, everybody.